it, your connection cannot be purely music. You gotta like the artist. Why do you like Jay? It's not just he can rap. I mean, he's a hell of a rapper. We all acknowledge that. But there's more. Beyonce, there's more. On down to Snoop Dogg, Wiz Khalifa. Every big major artist that we love has a thing about them that we're really tied into. Beyond just, I like that song. And I, I tell every artist like, yo, how are you gonna tap in outside of this music? When the music's not working, what else is there? What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. This is No Labels. And as y'all know, we like to talk to people who have taken interest in paths, the, the path without the labels, mm -hmm. who have done things unique um, in their career. Nick Love is here with us today, project manager currently mm -hmm. over Urban at 1RPM, but this man has done many things throughout his career. Too much. I'm, I'm highly, <laughs> highly interested, excited, and curious to hear some of the, just the information we'll get speaking with you, man. But first and foremost, appreciate you stopping by, bro. I appreciate y'all for having me, man. This is, it's a big deal. Any Anytime anybody invites you to stay platform, you should treat it as an honor. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody's trying to build their thing. They don't need you necessarily to build your, you know, to build their thing up, man. So for y'all to give me any amount of time is, is you know, I, I, I take it seriously, man. And I appreciate y'all. I was on time for y'all, wasn't it? Hey, bro. I showed up yeah. on you time. right on time, bro. See? Now, nah, yeah. That's a uh, like <laughs> to give you give uh, that professional credibility. Told said we needed an extra fifteen minutes, and he got here fifteen minutes on the dot. Yeah, right on time, man. For sure. Hey, for is sure. that a big thing for you? You know what? Yeah, it is because so many people want to have meetings with me, and you know, I I'm I try to be you know gracious enough to to honor that. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, I don't. People want to talk to me about random stuff. They want to talk about, you know, getting a job. They want to talk about marketing. How can I help them? It's usually how can I help them? Yeah. Cool. But when I give you my time, it's like don't don't play me. Don't don't play, you know what I'm saying? My time is too valuable. Yeah. And I don't say that like, oh, I'm so busy. It's just like I honestly have a lot to do. I have a family. I have things going on. I got my own life and mm -hmm. things that I'm trying to build, you know, on, on my end. So I don't have an you know, an hour, an extra hour for you to be late. And then you get there and you want to hold me for an additional hour. You know what I'm saying? And I don't like to rush people either. Yeah. I don't ever like to be like, hey, man, well, you showed up late, so now sh you only got four minutes. You know what I'm saying? That that feels cold, too. So it's kind of like, yeah. bro, just show up on time so we can do it right. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But no, it's, 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 it's crucial. It's, it's a sign of respect. Facts, yeah. It's a sign of respect. I'm huge on that, honestly. Yeah. yeah it's I a got in a, you know, little fights with my significant other about that kind of stuff before. Just like, hey man, it's late. Like you got me being late. That's going same. You know, I used to. My, <laughs> so my my ex wife, she was time, mm -hmm. time. Especially when we weren't together anymore. I used to really be like, yo, like you really think I have nothing else to do but wait on you? Like what's happening here? And she's, you know, my ex wife is one of the sweetest people in the world. But time terrible, yeah. awful with it, <laughs> awful with it, man. You know, so so she sees this, you know. You know, you know. Yeah, I feel like you said a lot too with people who don't work in music. Like they always assume that what you're doing is either fun enough that like your time isn't as right. significant. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or like you're just not doing something. So like, oh, you're just hanging out with artists today. It's like, no, it's a real. Now it's a that's job. my pet peeve. Yeah, people who disrespect what I do. Yeah, um, I'm a fun. You know, I love to have fun. I'm a fun loving guy. I love to crack jokes. I'll crack jokes with you all day long, but. My job is a job. Yeah. It's a job at the end of the day. Like, whether I'm at 1 RPM or not, when I was working for myself, I worked for myself for 13, 14 years on my own hustling. So it's like, my job is more than going to the club yeah. and hanging out with rappers and popping bottles. That's not my, though, my job comes with perks, but that's not really what I do for a living. You know what I'm saying? I don't pop bottles for a living. Yeah. I don't hang out with rappers for a living. I do, I, I have a function. I, I provide a service for these guys and these women that I work with. And so when people kind of reduce your job to all you doing is hanging out, all you mm -hmm. doing is like, okay, yeah. cool, you come, you come do it, and see yeah. how long you last hanging out, and it, it never fails. Like I've hired interns, I've hired employees, and they do it for a week or two, and they're like, oh, you actually working? I don't like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They like, oh, I thought I really thought we were just hanging out. I didn't know it took all these little menial details in between to really get to the 
to the fun part. Yeah. So let's, yeah. let's get into that because so I'm gonna read off just some of these, just your basic LinkedIn. Like you've done, <laughs> some, you, you've done some things. So I'm gonna start there. <laughs> Not my LinkedIn is funny. Yeah, hey. <laughs> I was surprised. You know, I didn't have a LinkedIn until a year and a half. I was about ago. to say, I was surprised. A lot of people on music didn't have one. So when it popped up, mm. I was like, oh, stop. I didn't have a resume. It's hard. You know, a lot of times you don't need one here. But let's let's get into it. So VP of promotions, uh-huh. no, VP of marketing and promotions at CTE yep. World, mm-hmm. formerly Corporate Thugs Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. That's on my resume. That's crazy. <laughs> Co-founder <laughs> and general manager of Coalition DJs. True. 2008 to 2015, mm-hmm. classic tour manager and brand li- liaison for Tequila Avion. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Jeezy. Shout out to Jeezy. Brand curator and co-creative director of Magic City. Mm. That's a fact. Okay. No lies yet. I ain't lied yet. <laughs> <laughs> Would love to hear those details. <laughs> President and general manager of Thousand Island, Inc. Yep, that's You're me. You're still doing that. That's my company. That's your consulting and things yes, like sir. that. And, of course, you're still... The project manager over at Urban at One RPM. Yeah, so it's a hell of a resume. It's longer than that. That was just the stuff that was, you know, LinkedIn friendly. Mm. The character limit. Yeah, well, not even that, man. Like funny, like so. One RPM fell in my lap. Like I wasn't even really familiar with One RPM like that. I had a couple of friends that were working there before me. They actually, had my same job. Okay. And that was the extent of what I knew about One RPM. I had no real knowledge of what the company was, what they did, who their competitors were, nothing. So out of the blue one day, I'm actually with a client doing my own thing. I was actually working with um, a, a gentleman that was running for attorney general for the state of Georgia. We were reading to some kids at an elementary school off of Bankhead. And I get a phone call from my guy, Orlando McGee, who was actually, you know, my boss. Uh, he's the head of Urban and the head a and uh, for Urban at 1RPM. He reached out to me. He's like, hey, man, you want a job? And I was like, not really. <laughs> he was like, yo, man, I need, you know, I, I got an opening. It's in marketing. I, I wanted to hire you a couple of years ago. I didn't think you would take a job. He said, I was having a conversation with one of your close friends, and he said that you and him was just talking about you possibly taking a job. He's like, I got it for you. Like, are you down? I'm like, eh. He's like, just come by the office. And we, I talked to him, and I'm like, it made sense. So I jumped on it. He said, but look, I can't just hire you off the strength. You're going to have to get your resume and it's got to go through, a, you know, a board. You know, yeah. people got to interview you the whole night. It's not just me bringing you in. I'm like, he's like, you got a resume? I'm like, not really. I don't have nothing. Everything I've ever done, you know, in my professional life came off of referrals. It was like, man, you know, Nick is the guy to do da 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 And they just people just brought me in. I've never had anything on paper that said these are my qualifications or this is what I do. It was all just hustle and people – yeah. That needed my service. Who heard about the last thing that I did? Even this technically was you just had to create it to go. Yeah, the no, process. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when you know, I put together some stuff on paper. I sent it to my partner Wes. Um, he put the resume together and whatnot, and I just took what he put, put it on LinkedIn, and that was my resume. But that resume got made three days before I actually had an interview. <laughs> like it was, you know what I'm saying? Like my concern was always, what am I going to put on a resume? You know what I'm saying? Like, if I, if I, like, because for me in the music business, I never had to apply for a job per se, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, if I go apply for a job at AT&T, what am I going to put on a resume? Corporate thugs entertainment? We got to take a quick second because we have some big news. If you like the marketing, branding, and music talk that we do in our content, you have an opportunity to meet with us in person and get the real deal information about how we are currently moving in the music industry, blowing up artists that we can't put online. So if you want to see myself, Sean, J.R. McKee, give you marketing, content, and branding advice that's absolutely guaranteed to help you move your career forward, then you want to make sure you check into this event. It's going to be super exclusive. We're only letting in 60 people, not 61, not 62. So if you don't make it, then you know your best bet is to hope that we do another one. So if you want to make sure that you're one of those 60 people, go to nolabelsnecessary.com or check the link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. And yeah, hopefully we see you there. In reality, and this is the thing that a lot of music people will tell you, in our world, one thing qualifies you for the next thing, right? You have experience doing something for Jeezy, you can probably work for Tip or Two Chains or Baby or QC. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You kind of move move your way through and up the chain. But what does that mean in necessarily the real world? 
what does working at corporate thugs entertainment qualify for qualify me for at AT and T? What does it qualify me for at any corporate situation? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know that the head of you know uh, what's what Home Depot. It's going to look at my resume like, oh, you ran the marketing for Young Jeezy? Great. We're going to bring you in and make you the, you know what I'm saying? You can run our marketing. You know what I'm saying? They don't look at it that way. So there's a fear and a like, oh, my God, what else could I do if I leave the music business? Because, I mean, trust me, everybody in the music business has wanted to leave it at some point just from frustration, egos, money, stuff just not going right, things slowing down. It's like everybody wants to get out, but it's like, get out and do what mm. what job is going to give me the freedom the time the money the opportunity the perks that the music business provides and you start to be like oh shit i can't do anything else so you kind of end up in this cycle man and it's a scary time until you realize like actually i'm qualified to do a million things mm. you just you know you just have to rework your perspective you just don't know how to yeah. put that in transferable space. yeah 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 because yeah. yeah, we talk about it a lot like there are been times where we would take like, these different corporate courses and stuff and we start seeing them talk about things it's like oh we're technically already doing that you just never heard the word before and you like even project management like crms all these different words it's like i right. never heard that until we start paying attention to other businesses but it's like oh I'm, i already have this technically like a million dollar skill set in the corporate world but in music for sure trying to figure out where it can be valuable. Yeah. Bro, I ran a food blog for a little while. Yeah. I had a thing called A Bite Life where I was one of the first people in like the hip hop space like interviewing people about restaurants and stuff around town. I got interviews on YouTube with like Travis Porter, 2 Chains, you know what I'm saying? Jeez, I got all these people that rocked with me that went out to restaurants to eat with me and we talked about food and that's it. That's dope. You can still see, I mean, you can still see this on YouTube. And this is like literally 2012, 2013, this is pre- Action Bronson, this is pre anybody doing anything of that space because I was an oddball. When I'm calling people and telling them I want to do, uh, you know, stuff in the food world, they're like, "What do you mean?" Like they were very confused as I was asking them to come do this. But that came from a low period in the music business where I was like, "I don't want to do this no more." Mm-hmm. Same thing I was just talking about. But I noticed that when I would go to food events because after I kind of made a little bit of a name for myself, a lot of the local events would call me and say, "Hey, you know, we want to invite you to our." restaurant grand opening or our food tasting or, you know, stuff that they would invite food bloggers and stuff too. And I get there, I'd be the only black guy in the room. And I started to realize like, I'm actually a little more qualified than anybody here. I'm the only one here that's used to staying up late to write something at two, three o'clock in the morning. I'm the only one here that's used to kind of zigzagging all over the city. You know what I'm saying? I kind of got these skills that I'm looking around. I'm like, yo, this is a bunch of house housewives and, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is that's who was in the space at that time. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, and the writers that were there, they were just writers. They were full time food writers, but they had no experience and no connection to the hip hop space. They hadn't done what I had done. And I'm like, oh, I really, I really got a handle on this. I just didn't think I did. You know what I'm saying? You had to see it mm-hmm. to really believe it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, definitely a confidence builder, I feel like, getting outside of the music space Mm -hmm. just to start to have conversations and get a feel Mm -hmm. for things because we even had an experience like that probably two years ago or maybe a year and a half ago now we were at this event it was like this private um type event and a whole bunch of companies people killing it like millionaires and stuff like that and then but they were like teaching so Mm -hmm. people going go up to the front and teaching all these subjects and the questions that they were asking and the, the things that they were teaching were stuff that we were like, bro, we do all this for artists. So anything in the marketing space, we were just like, right. we do all this. You know, like they yeah. were trying to figure out how TikTok worked and how they were going right. to I was like, bro, we know all this, like, about space. So it just boosts your confidence once you can kind of, like, see where you measure up outside of the space. And mm-hmm. Even if you're still in the space, I, I definitely have had that experience. But talk about, before we go into into the details of the, the job specifically that mm-hmm. you've worked and the experiences there, you mentioned – People wanting to leave a lot of times, get out for of the sure. music industry. Like, what was that like for you personally? Um, and why? I mean, I've had it a few times. You just the biggest one I think was w- when me and Jeezy fell out. And it's funny, I always tell this story, and I start with me and Jeezy fell out. Everybody's like, "Oh," and I'm like, "No, no, listen, we're good now. We're great now." Like, you know, what I'm saying, I see him, he sees me, it's love. 
there's a respect there, but that's really what it was. For me, it was a respect issue. Um, when I first started, mind you, the Jeezy, when I took the job as VP of marketing for CTE, that was my first, like, job, job. I had worked at DTP as an intern um, with Luda and Shaka and all those guys. I had taken a job with DJ Toomp. So I, 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 let me rephrase that. Toomp probably gave me my first job. But, I mean, this is like some under-the-table cash. Here you go. You know what I'm saying? They give me a couple bucks every week. Um, and I used to work with Real Street Promotions. I had done a lot, you know, street team stuff. So that's how I really got in, passing out flyers, putting up posters. I was making money doing those things. But how I really got my name was Jeezy. I met those guys. I was working Bobby V records and Player Circle records down in Macon. I met Kink. Mm. I met some of the other guys that was on Jeezy's team. And so we ran into each other again in Atlanta when I was working at the tag office of all places. My mama had got me a job <laughs> at the tag office in Fulton County. I was working off of Hocum Bridge Road <laughs> up in Alpharetta. And Kink came in, Kinky B, who was, who was Jeezy's partner at the time, he came in to get tags for their truck. And everybody at the job knew I wanted to be in the music business. The lady was like, hey, Nick, you know that guy that just came in here? I was like, nah, because I didn't see him. She's like, he worked with something, Thugs Entertainment. I was like, let me get up. So I get up, go outside. It's kink. I know him. He's like, man, what are you doing here? He's like, last time I seen you, you was down in making, working your move. I'm like, man, I got a job, bro. I got a kid. Like, I, gotta, I can't play with y'all all day. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, you know, I got to make money. He's like, bro, like, we looking for a marketing dude. He's like, man, you'll be perfect. I'm like, I said, man, if y'all hire me, I'll leave this thing today. Like, you ever seen Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah. And dude was like, yo, if you show me how much, you, sh you show me that check, I'm out of here. I'll call home right now and be like, I ain't never. Yeah. That's what I did. I, he, he told me, like, yo, I want you. I'm like, vet. When they resigned that day. And I, they were working out of a house. This is pre, this is right when um, Streets is Watching is getting done. Mm. So this ain't even TM 101 Jeezy. This is still mixtape Jeezy. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm out of here because I want to be in the music business that bad. But I give you that backstory to say this. When they met me, I was still very fresh and new. As the years progressed and I built my resume and I built my name and, you know, I was learning more and more and more. What I found was me and Jesus' initial class w clash was him still kind of treating me like the guy he met at age 22, 23. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm... 28, 29, I'm like, hey, like, this ain't that no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, thanks to you for the opportunity for sure. But now that I've accrued some knowledge and some experience and I've kind of taken on some more things, like, I know more. And that attitude of like, well, I'll, I'll just fire you. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll go somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? I would, I would have that confidence of I could just go somewhere else. And young, young Jeezy wasn't feeling that. He wasn't really <laughs> open to... Like, oh, you just, you know, you, oh, you think you can just, you know, it was that. It was just yeah. that machismo. Mind you, everybody was young at that time. When we started the CTE, everybody's 22, 24, 25 years old. It's really essentially a bunch of kids running around, thugging, in the music business. There's money. There's everything else. You know, mind you, this BMF era, this is peak of all, peak Atlanta yeah. at this point. So everybody's kind of making their bones in a city. And as men starting to kind of, you know, you know, bump clash, just bump yeah, heads, so, you know. Yeah. And um, it took leaving Jeezy, getting away from him for a while, coming back. And f and even then, like, I came back and it got weird for a little while. Then I leave again and I come back. One of the last times I came back, it was like, okay, cool. We've established, like, he's grown. I've grown. He, he acknowledges my growth. And, you know what I'm saying? And we can kind of have those mutual conversations and it'd be all love and, but that's what it was. It was kind of like, man, hold on. I'm in the music business, but I feel like I'm being treated like, you know, little bro. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to be little, little bro. I'm a grown man. I got kids. I ain't little, who little bro am I? I got a big brother. I don't I can't be yo yo little bro. You know what I'm saying? This ain't that. Um, but you you run into these you run into these egos. You run into these personalities, and you run into like, where is my where is this gonna take me? Where is my future gonna take me? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm watching everybody else grab Lambos and fly private, and I'm like, okay, this isn't mine. You know what I'm saying? Like I'll never be able to take CTE and hand it to my kids. You did, mm -hmm. so it's like I got to figure out what I'm gonna do, and you start to just get frustrated. Like, okay, what's where does where does this ultimately lead? And I was like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta figure out something. 
And when I left, you started. I started to realize, like, oh, a lot of people was only rocking with me because I was with Jeezy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember sitting in my house, like, oh shit, like, I thought I had friends. You know, what I'm saying? I thought I really had these close relationships. And it was like the minute I wasn't there, people was like, oh, what are we talking to you about? And that was a harsh pill. You know, that was a hard pill to swallow. To, to like realize like people are only rocking with you for your position or for what you bring to the table in the minute that you do no longer bring that to the table, you're you're useless. So um, that was one of the first times I was like, I want to leave all of this alone. All my life I want to be in this, and now I'm in it, and I don't like this side of what I'm seeing. Mm. And everybody in the music business will tell you that at some point, either their money got funny or the people got funny or the opportunity started to kind of dry up, and they was like, yo, I'm going to go do something else. I, I, lifelong dream since you was a kid to be in this, and then you're just like, one day, get me out of here. It's tough. Rare tough. I'm trying to get y'all too much. Oh, no, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's personal to me. So, nah, I, like I said, I could, I could talk about it in, in extreme depth. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it was, I remember them days vividly. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm appreciative of the opportunity that I have now, but even now I'm still looking like, okay, what else? What's the next move? It's interesting just because, you know, being in the industry, I've heard versions of of that everybody talking about, whether it's fakeness. We were just talking mm-hmm. to who were we? uh, Ferrari, was Ferrari last yeah. week. Oh, y'all yeah. had Ferrari on? Yeah. That's my guy. That's little bro. Yeah. I, I met, look, met him on the road. Word. We, Me and my guys were responsible for bringing him up here. We really? met him in Tampa. Him and my man Dave Who's oh, one of the man. heads of uh, Rock Nation? I'm not right. No, I'm sorry, not Rock Nation. United Masters. Oh, um, Dave was at United Masters. Him and Ferrari were like best friends. We met them. They were throwing parties in Tampa. We was on a promo tour with Interscope, and we came down with a group called Rock City. Um, incredible songwriters. They write some of everything. Like literally, if you look up Teron and Timothy from our Rock City, you'll see that they Rihanna records, Justin Bieber. I think they just wrote the the, the Dirk and uh, J Cole record. Crazy. Amazing, like some of the biggest songwriters you ever know. My man Ray Daniels manages them. Mm. Me, Ray, my man Biddy, and Rock City, we were on a promo tour. We ended up in Tampa. We met them because they hosted a party that we took Rock City to. They were like, yo, we want to come to Atlanta. We was like, come on up. You know what I'm saying? And my man Biddy put them on. Ferrari used to host my parties. That's my guy. So that's cool that y'all had That's him. funny, man. Yeah. yeah. Small world. Because he, that story of him going from Tampa to Atlanta mm-hmm. was big, so it's crazy. Yeah, Just for that bridge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he, he went through it, but <laughs> uh huh, uh huh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's dope. Well, I mean, wow, you just said something that that I did. And y'all got to pardon me, like I said, this is this is my life. So yeah. I and I, I've noticed that when I tell my story, people are like, "Tell me more." So I probably over explain now because I have to like make people understand why. Because I used to be real vague. Nah, it's you know, perfect, I come from that man. era where nobody took pictures and nobody yeah. really told you much. No, nah, and now I've like tried to overcorrect yeah. and be like, okay, let me give you this way. It's better, man. You know what People I'm saying? need to get the context. People need to get yeah, the context. That's the right way. Yeah. yeah, I want to give you context as to why or how. Like y'all, see, so you said you right, man. Oh man, I don't want to forget what what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna come back to me though. Tell me more about like let's let's go to Magic City. Okay. I, that job that you had, I forgot mm-hmm. the uh, uh, official title. Yeah, it was Bruce's brand manager over there. But what do you do as a brand manager? And especially, I think that was like 2017-ish or something, if I remember mm-hmm. the dates. Mm-hmm. There's already a brand, right, mm-hmm. Yeah, of Magic City by that time, a well-established brand. So well what does it look like coming into a place that already has that and then trying to navigate that? What do you... So... I love that you said it was already a brand because that's what that's one of the things I acknowledged, right? Mm. So oddly enough, that we in the church, that's how I met the owners of Magic City Church. The church I went to was off Kellen Road, where Flat Shows Cathedral of the Holy Spirit, one yeah. of the biggest mega church, one of the first big mega churches, especially in Atlanta, right? Mm-hmm. So um, at that church was a ton of talent, but you know, and I could go into all the people who went to that church too, but I don't even go there. Anyway, um, the owner of Magic City, Mister Magic. And his son, Lil Magic, who I know is Mikey. Uh, Mikey, we all went to church together. So we would get when we got a little older, Mikey would be like, yo, man, one day, you know, come out of the club, bro. You know, and I, I didn't even know nothing about the club. I didn't even know that that's what they did. 
Mikey one day was like, yo, yo, come out of the club. And I'm like, okay, send me the address. The address was Magic City. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, so, you know, go to the club. We might have been 18, 19, you know, young. Probably couldn't, I, I know I wasn't supposed to be in there. And I'm like, yo, Mikey works at Magic City. He's like, no, my dad, this is my dad's spot. I'm like, what do you mean it's your dad's spot? He's like, no, my dad owns. I'm like, what? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, we go to church together. Like, your dad owns yeah. one of the biggest strip clubs in the city. It's crazy. So fast forward to, you know, like I said, 2017, um, I was at the club regularly. You know what I'm saying? I'm managing coalition DJs at the time. My DJs are working at Magic City. I recognize that it's a, a brand, but I was having a conversation with somebody. I think I was in a meeting with Nike, and I'm like, Atlanta's brand has become strip club. You know, like the biggest brands in this city, like when you really think about from the out to the outside world, especially before that, Atlanta was civil rights, Martin Luther King, Coca-Cola. But if you live here, yeah. it's Coca-Cola, Magic City. You know what I'm saying? Like, I might be before Dr. King, which is crazy, right? But, like, <laughs> Magic City is a household name yeah. in Atlanta. Yeah. Everybody in Atlanta knows what that is. Yeah. And it's such a big name that when tourists come to town, white or black, they're like, I heard about this Magic City place. And so I remember going to Mikey being like, bro, y'all got this brand that everybody knows about. Like, y'all should be selling merch. Y'all should be doing all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know, we got the hoodies. I'm like, yeah, but those hoodies should be flying off the shelf. They should never be sitting here. Like, everybody in the city should be like a Magic City hoodie. People from out of town should be like getting a hoodie just the same way they would go collect memorabilia from Coca-Cola factory. Mm -hmm. They should be getting Magic City stuff the same way. He's like, bro, I've been saying that to my dad, but we don't have anybody to run it. He's like, we're so focused on the club. And managing the girls is a full-time gig. Like, the girls, anybody who's ever dated a stripper or, God forbid, had to manage a strip club and had to deal with 50, 60, 70 strippers, the personalities and the energy that come with the girls is a whole nother thing. Like, it's amazing to watch. Like, if you could just be a fly on the wall sometimes and hear some of the stories, see some of the things that go on. And I ain't talking about no sexual stuff. I'm talking about just pure per the personality of a woman who dances they're hustlers. They're aggressive. That they, that they, they are. It's a it's a tough room. You know what I'm saying. So I understand why all your energy and focus has to go to make sure they are where they need to be. You yeah. know what I'm saying. So he's like, bro, if we had somebody who could come in here and do it, we would gladly jump it off. I'm like, all right, bet. So I jump right in. I'm like, let's let's rock. This is my man. He brought me right in the door. No no resume, no application. <laughs> Just come on in here. And I started doing it, and I brought my man D Map in because Map was way more uh, into like the fashion space. So Map came in, and he started designing like new capsules, and uh, he he put out the Valentine's Day version of the hoodie. He was the one to introduce the different colors. But when I first started that, it was the black hoodie with the white writing, Magic City on the front. That was it. And I was like, yo, that's iconic enough to make this make sense. So I started just, you know, this is early influencer days. So I'm giving out the hoodies to. You know, the influencers here in Atlanta, the DJ, you know, just making sure that yeah. everybody who was cool had a Magic City hoodie. And it just built from there. And, you know what I'm saying? And people understood immediately what it was. Like, everybody's like, yeah, this makes complete sense to have a Magic City hoodie on if you represent Atlanta. Right. It's the best conversation starter in the world. If you ever wear a Magic City hoodie to the airport, everybody's going to want to talk to you. Because it's that wink, like, ha, ha, Magic City. You know what I'm saying? You see it. Yeah. Old white guys, teenagers. Rappers, whoever, it's like, nah, Magic City. Magic City is one of the biggest brands in this city, hands down, not yeah. even close. No, that's a fact. That's a fact. It's interesting that experience of building brands versus like this already there. And it sounds like you respecting the brand that already was mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. kind of just made things easier. For like, sure. You could have tried to overwork and like do some nah, stuff that didn't need to be you done. Don't need, some things you don't need to put your, you know, your twist on. Yeah. Some things are fine the way they are. You know what I'm saying? And that's probably the the lesson I've learned over the years is like some things you just need to come in and amplify what's already there. Mm. There's no need for you to come in there and put your, your to sprinkle your sauce on everything. You know what I'm saying? Like some stuff is just fine, just cool. Like, like, think of, like, your favorite chicken place or whatever. It's like somebody came in there, like, and even if they took something else that you actually like. Like, you know what I'm saying? Let's say you like, you like Chick-fil-A? Yeah. Like Polynesian sauce? Yeah. I like All right, it. cool. Yeah, I rock with that. <laughs> you like chicken from uh, Publix? Yeah. All right, cool. If somebody came and sprinkled Polynesian sauce 
on the public chicken, you wouldn't like it as much. Even though you like Polynesian sauce mm-hmm. and you like public chicken, together, you don't necessarily want them. You know what I'm saying? Nah, it don't hit the same. I've tried it, it before. <laughs> tried exactly. It. You know what I'm saying? With the Polynesian? Yeah, yeah. 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 See, see that sounds crazy, it, right? Yeah, 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 nah, <laughs> and it's like, yo, sometimes <laughs> that public chicken is just fine. Yeah. All you got to do is just serve it on a plate. Yeah. That's it. And I think some people, there was, I remember when I first started doing it, yeah, you got the like, oh, you working in Magic City? Like, yeah, but when people realize why and when I explain, like, yo, think about it. Like, what's, what's bigger than Magic City in Atlanta? Everybody's like, well, I mean, you, Oh no! Now that you say that, nah, bro. Magic City is Magic City is one of the. It's a top five brand in the city. Yeah, like yeah. literally outside of Coca Cola and like I said, maybe Dr. King. Maybe Waffle House. Waffle House. Yeah, Waffle House. Okay, Magic City. Yeah, well, that's it. Why, that's right? it. I mean, like <laughs> top five. That's you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's neck and neck for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like category. that's the kind of brand that they've built over the years, man. And um, even more so than some of the other strip clubs. This other strip, Blue Flame's been around longer than. Magic City actually by if we talk about length of time that it's been there, but the Blue Flame brand, uh, which I love, Magic City has transcended the Blue Flame brand. Do you have a have a sense of what contributed to that becoming that level of location? Brand? Okay. Location, it's in the city. Okay. And Mr. Magic had relationships. He was, you know what I'm saying? If you go look at some old Magic City pictures, you'll see Deion Sanders and MC Hammer, like these guys from the 80s, early 90s that are hanging out in in Magic City. So then when you fast forward and then Jermaine Dupree and Dallas Austin and Rico Wade and all these guys are in the club and then you fast forward to that, then it's Jeezy and Tip and it's Future and, you know what I'm saying, that legacy, even though a lot of those guys went to the other spots as well. They went to Strokers, they went to Pinups, they went to Blue Flame, they went to Babes, they went to, you know what I'm saying, they went everywhere. But... Magic City, because of the location, it being central and being across the street from that Greyhound station Mm -hmm. and having the food, all those things contributed to making the brand what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just became the cool spot that if you had a couple bucks and you was a hustler, if you was a pretty girl, if you was a dude that was kind of in the mix, that's where you went. The Flame was real west side. Like, if you're a west side dude, you go to the flame. Yeah. It's, like, it's like if you were east side dudes, you go to Strokers, you go to pinups, you go to Jazzy Tees when it was open, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. A lot of people, if you, you, you go where you live at. You yeah. kind of stick in your, it's like your neighborhood bar. Yeah. Mag City was where you came when you was in the city and you was trying to get in the mix. Yeah, where it all clashed. Yeah, yeah. so where all the cultures converged in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a quick second to talk about the elephant in the room. If you're an artist trying to grow, we already know what your goal is. A thousand true fans. Everybody talks about it. But how do you actually make that happen? How do you get those fans? It's not just about getting views. You got to push people further down the funnel. So let's talk about it. Number one, do you have these people's data, right? Do you have the ability to text and build highly engaging relationships with these people? Can you boost your Spotify plays to actually have engaged users, not those surface level playlisting plays? Well, guess what? Fever Fan is a platform that allows you to do all of those things in one. So it's not overwhelming. You don't have to switch and have all these different logins and switch all your LinkedIn bios. You have even a LinkedIn bio tool that you can do. So everything is done in one place. So not only do you grow your fans, you do it for less work. How about that? Check out foreverfanmusic.com because we know it's not about views for the day. It's about getting fans who will be there forever. Foreverfanmusic.com. Let's get back to this video. Can't like miss on any of the artist marketing that you're now involved in. Mm-hmm. I saw recently you did somewhat ASAP 12. ASAP 12, that's my guy. Album in stores tonight, midnight. And you had a post where you said you came up with an idea for them and y'all ended up in Paris or something. Yeah, what was so, the idea? So it wasn't necessarily, I didn't, so what I did was I had a relationship with my man Mel, Mel Testamar. Shout out to my guy Mel. Mel works with like Born Fly clothing. He works with, uh, you know, he works with a lot of different clothing lines. And so I was looking for a merch collab for ASAP 12. So anybody who is not familiar with 12, he's probably, he's one of the original members of ASAP Mob with mm-hmm. ASAP Rocky and Ferg and all those guys. Um, I wanted something that would help him stand out because, you know, it's easy to get lost in the sauce when you're standing next to Rocky. Rocky, who has been a star from the time they, that, that crew has been stars since they yeah. jumped out here. I mean, and he got Riri. So yeah, and he got Rihanna. So, I mean, he's already in another yeah, stratosphere. Yeah. Ferg has put out anthem after anthem, you know yeah. what I'm saying, when it comes to him. So, 12 and the other guys, 
you know, they've kind of been relegated to Rocky and them. You know what I'm saying? Or Rocky Ferg and you know, and the other guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted Twelvey to kind of you know stand out. And it was where where can we find these collaborations? Where can we find these um, brands that want to be a part of what we're trying to build here? And the original plan was to go with BBC, um, the ice cream. Because mm-hmm. Twelve Years album is called Kids Gotta Eat. So I was thinking, like, okay, where can I find something food-related that'll make sense and whatever? So I reached out to a couple of guys that I knew. Um, we just couldn't get the ice cream thing to work out. So I reached out to Mel. I'm like, Mel, I told Mel the idea. And he was like, well, you know, Twelve from New York. Maybe we can just do Staple. And I was like, okay, cool. But I had a What's meeting. Staple, staple is a, it's a clothing line called Staple. Jeff Staple owns it. Okay. Asian dude who has like been integral in like hip hop culture for a while, right? Beyond the clothes, he's been behind some of the dopest like hip hop logos and uh, clothing trends and art trends. Like he's amazing, dude. Look him up, Jeff Staple. Um, but it's a clothing line called Staple Pigeon. It's New York based, I've heard that super thing. dope, yeah, right? So you'll see it has a pigeon. The logo is like a pigeon. You you've seen it around mm-hmm. even if you don't know it. So anyway. I had a meeting with the guys, and I said, hey, guys, listen. Y'all wasn't necessarily my first choice. Let me just put it out there. I said, but I am excited to be working with y'all because you guys at least have bought into the brand of what 12 is doing. Here's the idea. I said, you know, he's working on the album. It's called Kids Gotta Eat. We're going to do this, that, and the third. They were like, oh, man, we love it. You know, we're familiar with him. First of all, we're familiar with him. We like him, um, and we like the concept of the album. They said, matter of fact, um, we're going to Paris Fashion Week. He said, and one of the guys like, y'all have a great idea. What if we did like a like an activation that's like food based? Like we can give out food, so like a little restaurant. I said, yo, that'd be dope. And then we, you know, we start adding little pieces to what it is. And one, maybe about two weeks, two three weeks prior to Paris Fashion Week, they were like, hey, we want to bring Twelvey out to perform at the activation. We're going to do a collab. It's going to be like a shirt. The shirt says ASAP 12 year on it. It got the track listing for the album on the back. It says kids got to eat. It's super dope. He's like, we should bring 12 year out to perform. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, let's put it together. And they were like, yo, Nick, you should come too. In my mind, it wasn't even, I wasn't going. You know what I'm saying? This was for him. I'm all about my client. I want to make sure that my artist is represented and he looks good. 12 like, nah, Nick, you come. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. So we get out there, bro. To their credit, staple, shots out to y'all. These dudes took an empty space, created a restaurant, like a cafe. Like, when I got there, I thought that it was a cafe already. They just stuck their name on it. They're like, no, no, this was nothing. We went in here and built benches, tables, a makeshift kitchen, put a bunch of staple stuff all over the walls, baked these menus that had, like, 12 stuff on. Insane. Yeah. And created a restaurant. They served a different item every day food-wise and played 12 music throughout the thing. It was amazing. Like, but that was just a play of just calling my buddy. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, man, like, I'm, this is what I'm trying to do. And you just never realize how certain relationships that you have will kind of shift things for you. Like, it shifted things definitely for 12, because that was the biggest. Outside of the YouTube uh, billboard that we did, that was the biggest portion of his promo that we've done. Like, that was a huge look for him, because it gave him an international look. And by the way, while we was in Paris, we were walking down the street. This, this dude got stopped 20, 30 times, bro. Uh, White kids, 12? Asian, 12 Yeah, We just walking down the street, me and him, like we just going, we going shopping. We just looking around, kicking it. Oh my God, you ain't said, let me take a picture. People showing us tattoos that they had of like ASAP mob on their bodies, like him, Rocky, Fur, like these, their faces on people's legs and arms. I'm like, wait, wow. what? Like, what's, ha-? you know what I'm saying? Like, I was tripping off that, but it just made me realize like how far hip hop has truly, like, infected the globe like for real like we're you know people always say hip-hop is a global brand but you don't realize the global brand until you see the globe you know what i'm saying like from atlanta you sure whatever that's yeah, some cliche yeah, shit yeah. you say yep. like yeah you know but to see it in practice to see these young white young asian young german kids out here looking like us dressing like us probably fresher than us actually these, these foreign kids might be cool <laughs> ain't gonna lie they might be cooler than us now <laughs> like for real like these kids they got swag. They got it. They got us down packed, and then they don't put their twist on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, them kids cool as shit. Yeah. Like, I ain't gonna lie to you. Like, I was like, oh man, are black kids not as cool as the? How did we become third in line on the cool? <laughs> Tripping. That's funny. Yeah, it's crazy you say that connection internationally because I remember being somewhere overseas and 
seeing like Beyonce and Jay Z on this billboard, mm -hmm. and it just hit different. It wasn't a billboard; it was like on the side of a mall, this long banner or whatever. Right. It just hit completely different when you see it there, and it was you know, and that's when you start to realize who has reached. Yes. That, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you don't see everybody when you're over there. Mm -mm. So the few people you see over there, if you're like, whoa, okay, like you're really doing something different. And obviously, we like Jay Z and Beyonce are already, we know they're like bigger, but still, even then, it kind of solidified for me. We were just having a conversation this morning where a guy on our team, shout out to Zach, he had this theory about the fashion space mm -hmm. and like people go into the fashion space and become like bigger stars right. in a way. And a, a large part of that, I, I felt like might have to do with just the international reach mm -hmm. that comes along with doing fashion. For sure. Uh, when you were over there for Paris fashion week and then like obviously we know ASAP, a large, a large part of that, right? Is, mm -hmm. That group is fashion and that collective. Yep. What did you, personally kind of observe especially working with with 12 in terms of like how fashion helps their brand as an artist oh it's everything um lifestyle is always going to be a huge portion of any brand um i tell i tell every artist i sit down with major or indie you got you need a lifestyle portion you need a lifestyle component to whatever you do the music ain't enough it's just not you know what okay. i'm saying and because music comes to go it's too much music coming out it's too hard to sift through the millions and millions and millions and millions of songs that are out and, are, and that will be coming out on a daily basis. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay, why do people connect to you outside of a song? Because if they only connect to you outside of, on a, if they only, if the only connection that a fan has to an artist is the music, the day that the music is mediocre, they're gone. You know what I'm saying? Like, Think about you and your girl. You said, you know, you have your six, you know, whoever, you know, your significant other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife. I got a wife. It's, it's okay. Cool. It's cool. You know, you got you know, to make sure, yeah, I got to make sure I'm proper with everything, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, think about this, right? If your only connection to her was how pretty she was, the uh -huh. day she ain't pretty, you out, right? The day she cut her hair weird, the day she don't dress the way you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If that's your only yeah. tie in to her, the day that that thing changes, you out. Yeah. There has to be more. There has to be a thing about her that you like beyond that surface thing, right? And that's the same thing with music. It, your connection cannot be purely music. You got to like the artist. And it's like, why do you like them? Most people that you like, you like them. Think about, why do you like Jay? It's not just he can rap. I mean, he's a hell of a rapper. We all acknowledge that. But there's more. Beyonce, there's more. On down to Snoop Dogg, Wiz Khalifa, Every big major artist that we love has a thing about them that we're really tied into, whether it's the weed smoking, whether it's the parties like Puff, whether it's the money and the opulence of Jay, whether it's the talent and the dancing and all the beyond. You know what I'm saying? Like we all have a thing that we're tied into beyond just I like that song. Mm. Because like I said, at some point they will ultimately drop a song that you don't like or that's not your favorite. And then you can't. there's a reason we don't just be like, oh, I'm done with Rihanna. You know what I'm saying? We like Rihanna because there's more to it than just the music. And I, I tell every artist, like, yo, how are you going to tap in outside of this music? When the music's not working, what else is there? You want them to like your fashion sense. You want them to like the fact that you are into video games. You want them to like that you're into old school cars. You want them to like that, you know what I'm saying, you're a dad. And I tell people, find your niche. What's the thing that you do outside of music that other people can buy into? Like, for me, I've always known it's... My kids, people love to see me hanging out with my daughters. I'm a girl dad through and through. I remember when Kobe passed and he had the whole, everybody's doing the girl dad hashtag. Everybody's like, man, Nick been on the girl dad thing because I got four girls. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got four daughters, 20, 17, 16, and five. So I've been girl dad for a long time. You know what I'm saying? And I've always been very proud of that because I didn't have sisters growing up. So it's just me and my three brothers. My mama was the only woman in the house. So when I had girls, I was over the moon. So I love showing off my kids. Everybody knows I'm into sneakers, so I'm always posting sneakers that I buy, stuff that I like, have my opinions on sneakers, and everybody know I love food. You know what I'm saying? So those are things that when I'm not in the music business and I'm not boring you to death with all my music knowledge, I can still talk to you about other stuff. And it's really, you know, really about being more well-rounded than anything, but mm -hmm. I always want to have a connection point that when I meet people, they can. They, they, everybody don't want to talk to me about music. Some people want to be like, yo, man. It's my anniversary. Where can I go get some good food? Yeah. I want to take my girl out. Where can I go? You know what I'm saying? Hey, man, you, you got a daughter, bro. What are you? 
man, how do you deal with that, bro? I've been trying to tell my you know my daughter woo woo woo, and I'm like, you know, I can relate to you on a parent level, uh, a going out dating level with your girl. You know, I can I can talk about a multitude of things, and I try to just make sure that I have a connection point to people outside of this. So if I'm doing it, you as an artist absolutely got to do it. Yeah, so it's interesting, man, because like lifestyle marketing is basically almost like culture hacking in mm-hmm. a sense, right? For sure. And so you you mentioned you give the same advice to indie artists as you do the bigger artists, figure mm-hmm. out their lifestyle thing you can uh, attach yourself to. But how do you measure the lifestyle impact for an artist who hasn't hit mainstream level yet, right? So, like, for example, we could see, let's say, like, 50 with the vests or the tanks, right? We could see certain right. aspects of his, his lifestyle translating over, like, Kanye with the glasses or, or something like that. But, like, when you're working with an artist who maybe isn't like mainstream yet, but you mm-hmm. know they still need to do it. Like how are you gauging if that lifestyle marketing was successful? If we can't watch like the whole world take on to it. Now, this is where analytics come into handy, right? So okay. like you start kind of watching the numbers. The numbers tell you everything. So even if you read Instagram analytics on the most basic level, right? So it'll tell you something like the age group of people that are following you plus like the, the ratio of like gender. So you'll have, you know, let me say 60% Men, 40% women, or whatever the case may be. So let's say you're doing something that is, I would say, let's label it, quote unquote, feminine, right? Cooking. Cooking traditionally has been a woman's or a more feminine trait. So if you're doing the more cooking videos, just start to see who's responding to what. You know what I'm saying? Are you getting more women followers? Are more women starting to follow you all of a sudden that when you post a video, who's commenting? Mm-hmm. Is it more women that's com- You know, so you start to kind of see who's truly paying attention to the things that you're doing. And then you can see if it's not catching. You know what I'm saying? Like, Or you might just be putting it out there in a way that isn't translating to who you want it to translate to. Um, video games generally skew male. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like I said, cooking generally skews more toward women. Um, cars, muscle cars in particular, skew towards men. There's little things that you can do to kind of just see, like, okay, uh, am I if you if you if your niche is cars right? Let's just say you you into painting cars or old school cars, or rebuilding engines and whatnot. Are you now getting invited to perform at car shows? Are you now are people from car brands like hey, let me send you one of my T-shirts so that you can wear it in your next? That you start to see who's coming to the party when you start putting that stuff out there. But you have to put it out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. But you just I just follow the numbers. I follow the info. Yeah, it makes sense. Like I said, if I'm talking about cars and I start noticing. I don't know, more of my audience is now leaning towards cars that we can assume is working. Yeah, or, you know what I'm saying, or let's say you're talking about cars and now you finally make a song that's about my car. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. you know, you're talking, you know, Crit was great for that. He always had like a My Sub or My Cadillac yeah. or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you start getting people that's hitting you like, yo, this is my Cadillac I just I just got, or this is my dad's car, woo, woo, woo. Now you're like, oh, okay, gotcha. They, they picking up what I'm putting down. Gotcha. And um, and that's the thing you want. You want people who are relating to you on another level besides I like the song or I don't like the song. It's it's, it's too fickle. Yeah. 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 I got you. There, there was another post I saw you put up too. Um, you said we got a billboard, but we didn't pay for the billboard. Yeah. Yeah. One, how did you do that? And then two, how much money did you save? The post I made, I made that post today. Right? I was talking about the billboard that we got with mm-hmm. YouTube. I said we pitched for it, we didn't pay for it. Yeah, there were so scores, yeah. I made that post because I, in the last month or two, I watched people. Well, first of all, let me say this: for the entirety of me being in the music business, I've always had people who were not in the music business tell me how the music business worked, and I'm like, how you know? Music and sports are probably the only two fields in the world that people who have never done the thing can tell you how to do it. You know what I'm saying? And we all do it. We guilty of it, right? We watch the basketball game and Shaq not making his free throws. You're like, how is he not? Make- Why can't he hit a free throw? And it's like, bro, I don't know if you could go out there and make 70% of your free throws yeah. in front of 30,000 people yeah. and the millions of people that are watching this thing on TV. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's trying. You know what I'm saying? But if you're at home, why can't he complete this 10 yard out? Why he couldn't just throw it down the field? Six? You know what I'm saying? We watch football games like, I would have just threw it yeah. It's like, <laughs> would you? You know what I'm saying? Like with eight people running towards you and a man double covered, you would have just threw it 60 yards down the field and you would have just lobbed it to him. Like that's what you would have done. Perfect. <laughs> right, perfectly. <laughs> and we do that with sports and we do that with music. Everybody who ain't in the music business or who's trying to get in it can tell you, oh, this is what Puff was doing and this is what Jay was doing and this is how these deals work and that's what the contract was saying. I'm like, man, you, what are you talking about? 
And so there was a thing on um, Twitter not too long ago where somebody was talking about the billboards in particular. Just yeah. like, oh, yeah, you know, the labels pay for that stuff. And, and somebody that I really respect in the music business, she was like, no, we, we, you pitch for those. Oh, no, that come out the artist's budget. And she's like, no, like, we pitch for it. And if we pitch it in time, because that's what happens, mm. you get the artist to send you the video or the song or whatever the case may be in advance. Hopefully you have three, four, five, six weeks in advance so you can send it to YouTube or send it to TikTok or send it to one of these, you know, the DSPs or one of the social media platforms. Tell them what you're trying to do. And then they say, oh, okay, we like that. Let's rock. We'll put that up. We'll use that as a banner for our site or we'll use that as the billboard or what. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, they specifically allocate support in that way. You know what I'm saying? You just have to pitch for it. It doesn't come out of the artist's budget. It doesn't come out of our budget. That's why we're pitching. I have to write a pitch. Yeah. And send it in and say, hey, this is the last single going into his album. The album's coming out on July 7th. The album is about this. This song means this. I got to send the lyrics over. I got to send everything because they know that what they're getting in business with. And cross your fingers and you hope that they rock with what you sent over. And we got it. Yeah. And I'm just like, take it from somebody who's actually doing it. This is what it was. You know what I'm saying? Like too many people like love to tell you what's happening. I'm like, bro, y'all don't have no clue, bro. Like, yeah. and mind you, we've pitched other artists before and didn't get it. That's how we know if we could just pay for it, we would. Yeah. That's the same thing with radio. <laughs> all this, so all these people have these ideas of like, oh, everybody just paying for this and paying for that. It's like, bro, do you know that if all it took was money, everybody would just do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen Fat Joe do these interviews. He's like, bro, if I could just pay for it, I'd have the number one song every time I put a song out. If all I had to do was pay to make my song number one. And don't get me wrong, there is money involved in promoting and boosting these things. However, if all if the only requirement was you got to have $250,000, wouldn't everybody with $250,000, whack song, great song, mid song, whatever, wouldn't they just pay the 250? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like so there is a bit of luck. There is a bit of uh, work and relationships and stuff that goes in hand in hand with this business. Most of it is relationship business. And that's like, I just get frustrated just watching people dictate and tell other folks, this is how it goes. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, that was for that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting though, man. Music fans would much rather believe you pay for it than you wrote a pitch. You know what I'm People like, who I'm losing would rather believe that the reason yeah. that they losing is because they can't do the thing that the winners are doing. That's right. Yeah. That's a that's a loser mentality. Yeah, it's like man, go get some money then. Yeah. Bro, that's my number. Hey, bro, well, listen. How to write a pitch? Thank you. I tell people all the time when when guys be like, "Man, these women out here, all they want is to do with money." It's like, well, do you like women? You know what you should do? You should go get money because if you believe that all they want is guys with money and you want to be with them, you gotta go get some bread. That's the game. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, you can't losers take the mentality of. I don't, I don't like that because all these folks they everybody, they think the winners are cheating, mm, and yeah. it's like, no. not really. But if you believe that, you should probably cheat too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like if that's what you believe, go do the thing that the the winners are doing. Yeah, and when you can't do what the winners are doing, it's like, oh man, oh, uh, everybody. I I love hearing the man. Everybody at the Rock Nation brunch is Illuminati, but they all they all gay. They all slept with some. You know what I'm saying? It's like. All that because you couldn't go, you know. What I'm saying? <laughs> like that seems extreme, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, yeah. Nick only got that deal because he woo woo. Or this person only was in, in at that meeting or got that opportunity because they did. Well, why it's like not really. Everybody ain't sold. They sold. Yeah. I've yet to be invited to the the, the soul selling meeting, and I've been in the business for 17, 18 years. I just I've never been invited. Maybe I ain't big enough yet yeah. to make it to the meeting, but I do know that. No one's asked me yeah. to sell, you know, to sell my soul, bro. And I've been living off this for a long time, bro. Like I've made good money. My kids are well fed. We've never missed a meal. We've bought cars, houses, traveled the whole nine. And let's soul not, still intact. Let's not let that pass because you got four of them too. Got four. Ain't missing meals. Ain't got four of them. And we eat good. Yeah. And we eat good, bro. Like I'm a picky eater. You know what I'm saying? Like I eat good. Like we eat out a lot. Yeah. My daughter's is bougie. Like they want hibachi, filet mignon. They want, they want it all. They want lobster tails. They want the whole thing. And it's like that ain't a daily meal, but it's an often meal. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. We eat out a lot. Um, but you know, it took time, and it, it wasn't always that. It wasn't like that from day one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Luckily, I don't have no vices. I don't smoke. I drink in moderation. You know what I'm saying? I don't 
I'm not. I've never been a Louis Gucci guy, so I'm really good with holding on to some bread. But like, one of my vices definitely is eating out. Like, you gonna eat good if nothing else. You know what I'm saying? So, and my kids be rocking, you know, right along with me. Oh man, man. Well, speaking of you know, food, drinks. Let's talk about the Avion Tequila era a little bit. That yeah. that brand and management area. What does it look like to help grow a liquor brand? I fell into that opportunity completely on accident, um, more or less. Jeezy, um, at the time, had gotten a sponsorship opportunity with them, and then he ended up buying into it. Um, so when we were on tour, I'm trying to remember which, which album this was, but we were on tour. And the Avion brand... Um, they were paying. They were sponsoring a bit of the tour. They was they were moving us around. We were flying this. We were flying private. You know what I'm saying? Um, on on the liquor company, but we were getting there, and Jesus was doing a lot of meet and greets, doing these bottle signings and whatnot. And he was like, "Yo, the company doesn't understand me. You know, Jesus. They don't understand me. They think that, oh yeah, we're just gonna go somewhere and sign some bottles. Like it'll be a cute little thing for Jesus to do. Not understanding that Jesus fans are." These are trap music fans, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm, and the yeah. liquor stores that we're going to, or that the stores that we need to go to are in the hood. Yeah. We're not going to Green's Bottle Store on Piedmont in Buckhead. We're going to, you know what I'm saying, the the the, the, the liquor store on Western Chapel. You know what I'm saying? Anybody who's familiar with Atlanta, you know, like, this is, mm-hmm. we going to... The hood, a lot of times. You know, we're going to Memphis, you know what I'm saying? And Yo Gotti's family is like, yeah, we're going to come with y'all because, you know, it's, it's it get hectic over there. We're going to come make sure y'all good. We're going to Chicago and it's like, you know what I'm saying, Fruit of Islam guys. You know, uh, Minister Farrakhan's godson is with us and he's like, yo, I'm going to go with y'all and make sure y'all y'all solid because where y'all going is, it, it get treacherous over there. <laughs> this ain't just some old... Yeah. Hollywood, you know what I'm saying, bottle signing. This is like we in the trenches with a bunch of people who are drinking liquor. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that want to see Jeezy and are adamant about seeing Jeezy. Mm. And so, you know, I was the one who was like, look, man, if we're going to do it, we need to have a DJ there. We need to play the music. You know, we need to make this thing a thing so that when people show up, they feel like it's an experience. Because, mind you, in order to get the bottle signed, you got to buy a bottle. So it's not just a simple, oh, Jeezy's going to sign my t shirt. It's like, no, you got to stand in line, pay 50, 60 bucks for a bottle of liquor. And then get it signed. You know what I'm saying? So this ain't even like a cheap thing to do. Everybody who comes got to spend some money. So now you got men, women, kids, everybody out here with cash in hand, in the hood, in line, for hours, getting tired. You know what I'm saying? So, but it, it, you know, I was the one who kind of came in and was like, yo, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to frame it. This is how we're going to make it make sense. And it just kind of, I just kind of fell into the position. Um, I learned a lot, though. I learned a lot about you know, what, how, how liquor companies make money. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you watch, if you're a person like me who go to all these parties and you see the liquor logo on the bottom of a flyer, you're like, oh, it's sponsored by Ciroc. It's sponsored by this. It feels like they're just giving liquor away. Mm-hmm. Liquor is expensive. If you ever tried to get into the liquor business and create your own vodka, create your own whatever, that shit is expensive. Like, that's an expensive business to get in. So anytime you're giving away bottles, you're losing thousands and thousands of dollars at a walk. So it, I'm, I'm always amazed when, like, a liquor company reaches out to me, like, yo, we need you to do promo. We're going to send you 30 cases. I'm like, I'll start doing the math. Like, even on the wholesale end, y'all just sent me, y'all sent me to my house $3,000 worth of liquor on the low end. You know what I'm saying? Like, and retail-wise, we're talking about maybe $7,500 worth of liquor in my garage. You know what I'm saying? From one brand. So I'm always blown away. But you learn, like, okay, what are the loss leaders? What makes the most sense in terms of where do you give away? What do you hold on to? How do you upsell? Um, you know, off premise, on premise. You know what I'm saying? My, my my fiance, she worked at a Diageo for a while, so I learned from her as well. But the liquor business is a is a very interesting business. And keep in mind, there's a lot of competitors, and mm-hmm. you're competing for shelf space, you're competing for branding, and in the urban space, you're really competing with. I mean, everybody know Puff. Puff is yeah the guy, but it goes back to lifestyle as well. Because I also realized that. Shouts out to my man Ludacris, right? But like. Nobody wants to necessarily drink a party like Luda. Mm. Everybody want to party like Puff. Right. You know what I'm saying? So Puff, that brand was a great fit for Puff because he's selling you right. lifestyle. He's selling you, we popping bottles, we having right. a good time, we doing the nightlife thing. Dame Dash, 
same thing. He was when they was doing Armadale and all the liquor stuff that they was doing for a while. When Jay Z does uh, the gold bottle, you know what I'm saying? The Ace of Spades, like they're selling you lifestyle. Some people you do want to kick it, like you want to date, like you want to move around because they're around women, they're around the nightlife, they look like stars when they're moving around. Some people who are actually stars still don't give you that same feeling, you know what I'm saying? So again, like what's your what's your thing? What's your right. lifestyle component that you bring to the table that is uh, that you can sell fans on? Because that informs the opportunities you can take advantage of. Yes, I, I remember everybody. Thinking like, oh yeah, I can get into the liquor game. You start yeah. seeing R and B artists, mm -hmm. like rappers, everybody getting into, into the liquor game. But like you said, I mean, everybody didn't have those puff daddy white uh, white parties, and right. Things like that, that history, right. So yeah, like I'll, I'll even say this, like you know who's killing it, Ross. Yeah, Rick Ross is one of the best at it because he's giving you opulence, he's mm -hmm. giving you lifestyle, he's giving you my look at my big house, look at these big parties, I'm the biggest boss, I got mm -hmm. these things. He sells you that, so it's like, yeah, I want to kick it like Ross kick it. Yeah. Um, but when I, when you think of other artists, they sell you fashion. You're like, okay, I want to dress like him. I want to smoke like him. I want to, I want to get women like him. I want to do this. But then there are some other people that are just they're just talented. Nothing wrong with being just talented, but I mean, it's hard to sell things when you're only selling again. You're only selling talent. Yeah. What's the thing that people want to do like you? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is what is it? I know that when I put out my food content, and not on some food blog and stuff, but just like, I know people look at me and say, man, I want to move, I want to take my parents out in a sprinter and Father's Day and do the big thing like Nick did. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been able to like do some really cool things with my kids, with my parents. Because, again, I'm giving you family. I'm not giving you, you know what I'm saying, popping bottles and yeah. $3,000 nights at the club, $10,000 sections and throwing money in Magic City. I'm giving you, I took my family out and my mom had a great time. My, my mama likes me. You know what I'm saying? My mm. dad, and that's important to me. I grew up to be a man that my mama appreciates. You know, my dad appreciates, you know, my dad looks at him like, yo, I respect you as a man. My kids look at me and say, that's my dad. My dad, all right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was big to me. So I'm selling family, but what are you selling? Whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the tough. ASAP Mob, fashion. Dipset, fashion. You know, yep. Snoop Dogg, Wiz Khalifa, weed. weed yeah. mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like it's and, and in the inverse, Lil Wayne is as famous as famous can be. Lil Wayne has a couple of liquor brands that he's attached to. I don't necessarily want to drink like Wayne. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Wayne doesn't give me. Yeah. Oh, man, I want to just pull up and kick it like Wayne. Yeah. And when I do think about pull up with Wayne, I think about something different. You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. not. Party Wayne, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think Wayne getting high and going to the studio and doing what he do. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Wayne, as big as Wayne is, what is Wayne selling you on the lifestyle side? And I think he does sell a lifestyle. Yeah. He sells you, he gives you rock star. Uh, he was the one with the skinny jeans and the chain wallet yeah. and the whole night. You know, he gave you that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even on the record with Khaled, he's like, you know, I'm the I'm the prototype. I was, all these guys look like me. They, they got dreads. Yeah. They got... The rock star look, the tats on the, they got that from me. Wayne is that, but Wayne is not selling you party. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I never thought about it until you said it, but as big as he was, it, he didn't really have a lifestyle brand until he started leaning into the, the skate. The era. skate, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And yeah. that's the thing that I always <laughs> remind people, like, yo, even little Wayne a has a thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, hmm. Birdman has a thing. Nikki has a, you know, these these people, this isn't happening in my accident. These are, This is purposeful thought out marketing yeah and that's what i do for a living i purposefully I, I make purposeful thoughtful decisions on like how are we going to make this make sense yeah so how soon into i guess you know working with an artist let's just assume like you you come in you find an artist that, that ground zero you like them like the music like the talent how soon into working with them do you start trying to introduce lifestyle marketing immediately but really i look at that before i do anything okay I, if i meet an artist on the street I'm like, what's, I, I try to like size him up. Like, okay, what's the thing? Is he fresh? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's, I want to figure it out early on because it's super hard to take somebody that's talent, talented and make them cool. You can take a cool person and find a record. It's hard to take a person with a record and make them cool. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, because again, the song only gets you but so far. Yeah. So I'll, you know, when I meet people, I'm just like, who he with? Is it, did he, 
I've had people meet me and they bring 20 of their guy friends. And I'm like, I don't really want to do this. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it feels aggressive. It feels, yeah. and that's not what I want to be a part of personally. Nothing wrong with it. That's just not what Nick wants to do. I don't want to do the thing where we're we're doing the shootouts and the, and the you know, I, I've done that already. I've actually had that era for years and was it was fun when I was 25. At 43, not as much. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not looking for the guy who shows up and like, yo, man, I'm the biggest trapper. I'm the biggest whatever. You know, like, I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? Now, if he show up with 40 chains on, I'm like, okay. And he pull up in the, you know what I'm saying, something big. And I'm like, oh, okay, gotcha. There's some money here somewhere. Okay, now let me hear the music. You know what I'm saying? Because I see the look. Now let me see if the music matches up. And a lot of times, that's the unfortunate part. Now I don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying you got a dude that got all the money in the world terrible artists yeah. or you have a dude that can wrap, his, wrap circles around everybody don't have no money oh, bro, it's crazy. they never it, the, the, best, <laughs> the most talented people never have money it's the weirdest thing in the world yeah. every now and then it, it matches up though Yeah. but yeah, I'm a pre but I love artists that sell style I love fresh rappers mm. I, Dro I one of my you, favorite rappers one of my favorite Oh man! And not only is he talented, yeah. but he's selling you something that you don't find every day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like everybody's selling you, I sell dope. Everybody's selling you, I kill a bunch of niggas. Everybody getting you that. Dro is like, look at me, <laughs> I'm I'm killing it. Like look at what I got on. I'm so fresh, and I'm like, Clean. yeah, you are, yeah. you are fresh. You know what I'm saying? Like that's <laughs> why I love like that Dipset movement. I love it's, mm -hmm. I love anybody who's giving me fresh because fresh is fresh takes some some. It's a that's a skill. To get fresh. Everybody can go to the store and buy some clothes. Putting it together. Because I don't have that. And it's an attitude. Yes. Mm -hmm. I dress okay. But I'm also very matchy matchy. And I'm also a mannequin guy. Like, you know, let me get that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I see kids that pull up and they have like a green hat and a red shirt and blue shorts and some shoes. And I'm like, damn, but it kind of came together. I would have never picked that out on my own. So I love seeing it. Where I'm like, damn, like you really... Like, figured something out here. Like, you got your shoestrings matched the thread on your shirt. And I would have never mm -hmm. seen it, but I, I appreciate the eye that people have for it. So I love that, man. So I, 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 I want the lifestyle component off the rip. Show me that if you the guy who showed up to the club with 40 girls, now I'm like, oh, okay, what's, what's happening here? You know what I'm saying? Now I'm curious. You showing up with 20 of your homeboys, it's like, all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying but if you got 10 girls with you now I'm like okay I see I see what's happening yeah. or I think I see you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you feel like the, the fashion side of lifestyle marketing is, is getting oversaturated though? for sure it, yeah for sure but only it's only saturated on the designer side okay because everybody's way of getting fresh is I got a Prada jacket on a Balenciaga hat mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. the Gucci shoes I got the you know what I'm saying? The Chanel belt. I, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's doing that. And I'm like, that shit look country as hell. Y'all niggas boogie. It's just expensive. You know what I'm saying? And that's the part that bothers me because I'm style. like, yo, you don't have no, there's no style there. Yeah. Like, y'all not actually fresh. You just have a lot of expensive stuff on. Mm -hmm. And like, I know some guys on the executive side and on the artist side. And I be looking at them on, on Instagram. I'm like, you look country. You like, you like, the outfit six grand. I take offense to that. But y'all look, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> In Atlanta, people are the worst because, and like I said, I take it from an Atlanta. They got money. I know that that's how we perceived anyway. We perceived mm -hmm. as being country and slow and boogie, no, don't have no style, don't have no style. Mm -hmm. So when I see an Atlanta person, and I'm like, damn, you look like what they be telling us we are. <laughs> you got, you look crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I appreciate people who just know how to put it together and it be real fly. Yeah. And I'm not even no person that's like, oh man, you why you got to wear your brand? Like, I'm not that guy. Like, hell, put it all over print. I don't care about that. That don't bother me. If you got Louis, 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 Louis all over your shirt, the LV, big, I don't care. Just put it together in a fly way. You're not selling me on you fresh just because that, you know, those shoes happen to be Balenciaga shoes. Yeah. I don't care. Do yeah. it look good with what you got on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Are they? Uh, is everything fitting right? Yeah. Like we going back to a baggy era now. I don't know if y'all noticed, but yeah. like everybody's mm -hmm. getting back to the clothes are a little bigger now. Yep. Yeah. So now. Not that you look crazy wearing slim, because I still prefer the more slim, tailored fit now that we've gotten into the era. I like that era. But now you start to notice, like, okay, who's keeping up? Are you still wearing everything super, super tight mm -hmm. and skinny jeans and skinny shirt and, you know what I'm saying? Or are you kind of getting with the times? And, like, I'm, I'm always paying attention to who's, who's looking. 
Because I'm looking. I look every day because I don't want to be the old guy in the room. In a, you know, in any yeah. way, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to yeah. be the guy that's old in appearance, old in thought process, old in nothing. Like, I want to know what's popping. And so I'm, I, I, I keep up. So I'm, I'm looking around and saying, like, are you keeping up? You keeping up? Are y'all hip to what's happening? Because I see it. That's why I say that artists are ultimately selling their POV. Mm-hmm. Everything you do, your taste is just the decisions you make yes. musically, you know, dress, mm-hmm. what you decide to eat, all those things, right? Yep. And, you know, if they're, poor, if they're poor decisions, you know, poor taste, then people won't follow them. But I think artists struggle with the idea of more than the music mattering. Something that you've been harping on a lot. Like, mm-hmm. it's going to be some negative comments. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like oh, no, it should just be about the music. But when you think about artists in general, that just that goes beyond music. And I think a lot of artists, like music artists, actually settle into being a musician and really what they're thinking. But an artist is always is entail all elements of it. You know what I mean? Artists last. Artists last. Artists last forever. Yes. Rappers, singers come and go. Mm. I don't know. Rappers and singers come and go. Think about here's something now this I always admire this about LA Reed. LA Reed, the people that he signed to LaFace early on, those people are still famous. We still see those people and be like, wow, Usher. Yeah. Wow. TLC, wow. Even yeah. post left eye, Tony, weight gain, them, age, yeah. everything. We're like, wow, TLC, Tony mm-hmm. Braxton, Outkast. All, we're like, man, these people are still, like, you know what I'm saying? And yes, the era made a difference in terms of their exposure and your people's attachment to them, but these people were picked because not only were they talented, they had a look, they had a style. Like, why do y'all think R&B niggas take their shirts off? That's part of the, <laughs> the, the aesthetic of it. It's like, I'm not, I'm not selling you that I can sing, I'm selling you sex. Yeah. I'm selling you, I'm singing to you. You know what I'm saying? This yeah. Tank is singing to that girl in the crowd. Usher, Usher, who we all, you know, I've been hearing about that on social media all day with Kiki Palmer. Usher is singing to her. Oh, I missed that. I got to get on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all got to catch up to the whole Kiki Palmer drama. It's oh, mess. Boy. It's messy. Oh, but <laughs> I won't even go into it. You should watch. You should just get on Twitter and, and, right, and just man. search Kiki Palmer. You'll, you'll oh, get everything boy. you need to know. But. Usher takes his shirt off. Chris Brown does all the sexy gyrating and all that mm-hmm. stuff. He's singing to yeah. you. He's selling you beyond, hey, I can sing or I can dance. It's, I'm selling this fantasy, this image, this whole thing. And again, it's not necessarily fashion. It's not cause, whatever. But that's the thing he's selling. That's the lifestyle portion. I'm selling you sex. I'm selling you fantasies. I'm selling you images. Um, whereas on the flip side, and this is a bad example, actually, because she's very sexual, as we found out in recent years, Jill Scott. Just got selling you souls. Yeah. Just got selling you like, yeah. I'm giving you something from the heart. I'm giving you this heartfelt, you know, thing that's connecting with you on a on a on a different level versus I'm sending I'm singing this sexual song, whatever the case may be. Jill Scott's giving you something. You know, she's selling something else. Yeah. Um. She's sell, much like Erica Badu is selling you something else. These artists, it ain't just the rappers. It's the singers. It's everybody. Like every women, men, women, they're all selling you something if they're any good. The artists that come and go, or the rappers and singers that come and go, are people that just sang a song, went home. Mm-hmm. You don't think nothing about them after the end of the day. They can create the art, but they can't sell it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, because the other part is what connects with you. And that's marketing. Marketing is, you know what I'm saying? And marketing and branding, all of that stuff is what's connecting with the person outside of this, what outside of the surface. Mm-hmm. Everybody can say, oh, man, every black person I know can sing a little bit, <laughs> dance a little bit. Rap a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if I if I stop for a couple of days, I'm sure I could write you 16 bars. Yeah. They won't be Jay Z level, but they'll be decent. You know what I'm saying? So why do you care that I rap versus Lil Baby? What is the thing that makes Lil Baby different from me? He's he's selling you something else. He's selling you Lil Dominique from Oakland City. He's selling you, you know what I'm saying? This this lifestyle that he led, that people can verify that he led. You know what I'm saying? Like he's selling you something else. Young Thug, Future, all these guys are selling you something, which is why it's so disappointing when you have these. Oh, you know, so and so was snitching, or so and so woo woo. It's like, damn, I was buying into this thing you were yeah, selling. Broke the fantasy, and now yeah. the wall came down. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> that's the tough part of when you're selling. Yeah. That's why R and B artists always were like, they got, I got to remain single because I'm selling you. You could possibly get with me. 
You know what I'm saying? And so when I show up married, it's like, oh, now I've killed the fantasy. Which now we realize that women don't care. You be married, eh, whatever. We, yeah, y'all yeah. know we men in the room. Women probably probably makes you more attractive to be with somebody at this point. But again, that was the reason they were all selling you something, and yeah. it was always about keeping up that veneer of the image I'm giving you. I want to end it with something we probably should have started with. Okay. Mm. <laughs> 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 I just couldn't even know what it is. Oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, okay. You know, he's he's <laughs> like, you know knew exactly what it was. Nah. <laughs> what does a project manager do? You're a project manager at 1RPM. What do you do? <laughs> um, project manager slash product manager. I'm just overseeing an individual artist. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm overseeing the marketing, the branding, the the sequence of events that lead us to the release of a project. That's really all it is. Um, my job is to get it from conception to, you know, to out the door. Um, so many artists that we have signed at one RPM, they will say, Hey, look, I want to drop an album four weeks from now. And I'm like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. we can't do that. Cause we need to release some singles. We need to kind of build it up. Like I'm looking at everything. I'm looking at the analytics and I'm saying, oh, okay, cool. Today, your monthly listeners are hundred thousand. I would love to get you to 250 before we put this album out. In order to get you to 250, we need to release a, you know, we need to release a song. See what the, see what the fans are responding to. See the algorithm kind of peak up. It's kind of like you know, you're just waking up the algorithm. It's a, it's a lot of that kind of goes into it, but ultimately that's what it is. My job is to care for your project like it's my own and just get us to the finish line. Mm. Um, again, it's not as simple as just we can put out a song. We, somebody needs to pitch for playlisting. Somebody needs to pitch for those opportunities like we were talking about with the YouTube billboard. Somebody needs to pitch for uh, you know, TikTok to put you on their playlist. Somebody needs to pitch for um, Instagram to give you what they call a, a Reels amplification where they kind of boost your stuff up in there. You know what I'm saying? Like There are all these little things that are important now in terms of uh, playlisting. And, you know, we don't want just the playlist to get on the playlist. We want to be in the top 10 songs on the playlist. We want a cover of the playlist. Like It's all these things that we know because the, the numbers and the statistics say that some people will put on the playlist and walk off. But within about 10 to 15 songs, maybe even less, they'd be like, oh, I want to hear something else. And then they go. So if you're number 40 on the playlist, not as effective. It's a great look, but it's not as effective as if you're the first song on the playlist. Because mm-hmm. even by accident, if you're the first song on the playlist, somebody will hit the playlist, your song will come on, and they'll be like, oh, I'm going to hear something else. So you kind of get streams almost accidentally. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But again, it takes relationships. It takes pitching. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes forethought. Most artists are just talented. They're creative. But on the business side, not so much. You know what I'm saying? And so my job is to bring the business component and make sure that the company is happy as well as the artists and find that happy medium of how we can deliver what everybody needs. You talked about getting that streaming number up a little bit before dropping a project. Yeah. What's your mentality when you talk about rolling out or the timing of when you will or won't drop something? Um, It's gut for me. I think sometimes you hear music, you're like, man, this feels like summer. It feels like... Everybody outside partying. Sometimes you hear something, you're like, man, this feels like very somber, wintertime, lovey-dovey. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're all se- you know, we're seasonal people, right? So we know, you know, the joke is always cuffing season, right? You know, we all joke about cuffing season. Cuffing season is like when it gets cold. You know what I'm saying? You need somebody to be a companion with during the holidays. And then Valentine's Day roll around, y'all break up so that you can be single and free for the spring and summer. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times, you know, I, that's a real thing. So yep. music sounds like summer. Music can sound like winter. Music can give you the feel of spring. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you listen to the music, you listen to the type of artist that you're dealing with. You know, you look at the artist, you look at what they've delivered before, you look at kind of who their fans are, and you're like, bro, like, you need to drop when it's festival season because your fans are at the festivals. Or you need to drop in the wintertime because when your fans are all in love, that's when you need to be putting out this music. You know, it's that type of thing. Of just understanding, like, man, we should wait. Like, this music sounds too slow to be summer records. Mm. You don't, you don't really get a lot of slow ballads in August. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about it. You don't, you don't get slow ballads in May. Yeah, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's Fourth of July. Everybody outside. Everybody want to party. They want to kick it. They want to dance. You know, you get all your twerk records in the summertime. 
you know, you get all them, you get all them records now. You don't get that. You know what I'm saying? In the wintertime, nobody's twerking because it's too cold. Nobody's standing in line at the club. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, for real. Too like cold. nobody twerk. Yeah, like nobody's standing in line at the club when it's 40 degrees outside. Yeah. 70 degrees outside, they on the patios, they on the rooftops, they kicking it. So you just, it's little stuff like that. It's little nuances that you learn. You know what I'm saying? Um, holiday weekends are great for some, terrible for others. Jeezy, we used to always release on Memorial Day weekend. We knew. Because Jeezy was going to go do parties all Memorial Day weekend. We knew that. So that was the perfect time for Jeezy to put out a mixtape because we knew all weekend was going to be able to perform that mixtape, pass it out, put it in everybody's car. So when everybody's riding down the strip on Ocean Drive in Miami, Peach Street in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, Sunset in L.A., we're going to be bumping this Jeezy. We knew that because of the season. You know what I'm saying? But it works different for everybody else. So it's, it's just a matter of just knowing your artist. Knowing his fans, knowing, you know, just the little nuances of going on throughout the years, little stuff like that. Oh, no. I love it, man. Well, appreciate you having a fellow Decatur native <laughs> on the podcast is actually dope because I didn't know that. Where, where in Decatur are you from? So, born in Eastwick, moved off to Tilson, and then. You know, parents divorced, so my mom moved to Riverdale, but I stayed ah. off of Candle Road up. My there you life. go. Yeah, yeah, East yeah. Wick. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, what about yeah. you? Where you from, man? Uh, you know where Griffin is? Yeah, I do know Griffin. That's Jody Breeze. Yeah, I'm off in that way. Jody Breeze is my cousin. That's funny. What? Yeah, that ass. You ain't told me that. Yeah, swear to God. Look at that. Look my at that. Now, called, I'm, now I'm asking the question. Swear to God, bro. Hey, <laughs> listen, let me tell you something about your, <laughs> let me tell you something about your cousin. Real name, Jacoby White. That's on my dad's side, bro. Let me tell you something about your cousin. Your cousin is one of the most <laughs> dopest rappers. That I've ever heard. Yeah, no, he's like, fine, from yeah. from from lyrics from lyrics <laughs> to presentation to everything. Jody's so he's super dope. Yeah, super dope, man. So shouts out to him. Yeah, like I, I him, wish no, nothing but good things to Jody Breeze. <laughs> shouts out to the fam. I ain't never said it all out loud. So you know, that's all right. Time. That's all right, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, we getting the no labels necessary fun facts today. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, I'm Brand Man Sean. I'm Corey, and we out. Peace.